So welcome to the October 26th Council Rules Select Committee. I'm required to announce that you are being audio and video recorded. First um, item up. For the record, it's, it's I think it's October 12th. What did I say? 26th, I think. Oh, I was looking at our next meeting time. Let's start. Yes. Welcome to the October 12th Council Rules Select Committee meeting. There's audio. Um, I am required to announce that we're being audio and video recorded. Okay, and here's member Baskin. So let's start with a roll call, please, Laura. There Councilor May Ori. Here. Vice Chair Simon. Here. Member Baskin. Here. Councilor Dwight. Here. And Councilor Foster. <coughs> Excellent. Sounds like we have a quorum. And first up on the agenda is public comment. Um, I see, um, actually, I'm going to make an announcement before public comment, which is, this isn't something I'm going to deliberate on right now, but I am doing an experiment and I invite all of you to join me. For the, the duration of this meeting, I'm going to use, I'm going to drop titles and use people's first names because um, Ezekiel had brought up that as an agenda item. And I thought it would be an experiential, it could be an experiment, and we can just sit with it and see how it feels when we drop titles. And we could possibly talk about the decorum clause or we can add it to a later agenda. But I, I think for one meeting, it would be an interesting experiment. You're not required to, but I'm, that is what I plan to do. And Laura, I'm encouraging you to, but of course, whatever your comfort allows. Okay, now on to public comment. I see some counselors here. Do they have their hands up? I don't believe so. Okay, so no no hands up from Councilor uh, Jim or Mary Ann. Good, thank you. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. So uh, the first item up then with no public comment would be approval of the September 29th meetings. Did everyone get a chance to look at those? No, so maybe this is something we table. I, I was going to move to approve, but ah, okay. How, um, Councilor Foster? Laura, I appreciate your hard work, but I, I, it's okay. I didn't get a chance um, in between you sending them in the meeting to look at them. Okay, sounds good. I can okay. put them on I, the agenda I, for the next meeting. <clears throat> I withdraw my motion. Thank you, Bill. Um, okay, great. So we will move on to topics regarding. The Council Administrative Assistant, Rule 2.5 Administrative Assistant to the City Council. Laura, is this something you could screen share? Sure. Thank you. Oops. Give me a moment, here we go. So I'm not going to read all through these. We'll look at them together. Um, by the way, well, um, it looks like this Marianne and Jim are here, but I'm trying to get practice of, of announcing also that if you need closed caption, it's now available generally at the bottom of your screen where it says live's transcript and pe people listening in have to do it individually. Uh, okay, so here we are, 2.5 administrative assistant to the council. I just lost it, I think. I, okay, so I need to keep screen sharing it then. Oh, okay. I, I, can, I, I think that if I try to take minutes, then you guys start seeing my minutes. Is that what's happening? Oh, That's I don't like, know. I, uh, uh, yes, but I, uh, Al, it's going to be an inter interesting challenge. Al. <laughs> right, so um, I asked this to be put on the agenda. This was one of the areas that I had identified when I was just going through the rules. There's two things I want to bring up. Uh, the first is, that the uh, administrative assistant under the current rules is appointed 
uh, solely by the council president. But uh, this appointment is the only appointment that the city council does not ratify. So you, ha you have two employees. You have the, the administrative assistant and you have the auditors. Those people work for you. You hire them. Uh, you have to approve the auditors. And you are also required to approve the mayor's department heads. Mm -hmm. um, but the full council has no say at all in the, in the appointment of the administrative assistant. And that's an exception that I don't see any reason should exist. I think you should have a vote to ratify this one too. So it just puts it in line with our, everything else that all your other responsibilities for um, oversight on appointments. That's the first thing. The second thing uh, pertains to the last, the very last rule in that section that we saw briefly, which is 2.5.1.9, which for a reason we can maybe discuss, um, the, the administrative, the council administrative assistant is to advise the council president on matters of parliamentary procedure. It requires the administrative assistant to effectively act as a parliamentarian. Um, which is a curious thing given that I don't know that the person is hired uh, expected to have parliamentary procedure knowledge and I'm, my, I'm gonna guess that training in, in that topic never happens. So to ask an administrative assistant um, to be the parliamentarian for the city council seems like it shouldn't be and I would suggest that be removed. Those are my two suggestions. Bill, Laura. I was just gonna say, I'd be very happy with that removal. I've never felt comfortable with that responsibility. Always very relieved when the city solicitor is there to respond. I would welcome training on it. And I do try to read Robert's rules of order if I'm anticipating a particular question, but you know, it's not my area of expertise. Bill. Well, <clears throat> The uh, job of the administrative assistant came into existence actually along once the new charter was approved. In fact, actually it was the city clerk who provided all the services that Laura currently provides, although Laura actually much more. Um, that was, I was council president at the time and actually argued for and got the position of administrative assistant. Um, um, a separate department that was beholden not to the executive, but to the council. The job description was basically drafted as based on the need. The parliamentarian issue, of course, is um, we, it is appropriate for the council and, and I think important for the council to have someone in official capacity to serve as, as at least a parliamentarian reference point. We're given Robert's Rules of Order in our desk when we, when we go into the council, but the fact is you can't start leaping through Robert's Rules of Order when there's some question of parliamentary conflict. There's not, it's rare, it does happen, but it, it's good to have someone who can serve as a reference. It was actually built into the job description when uh, we created that position. The issue of, as far as approving, you're right, Al, and, and I, I don't have a problem with changing that. It was, as I said, essentially, this position came about as uh, an act of necessity, and we're making it up as we go along. Um, there, were, there were no processes at that point that, that apply. So, but I do agree. I think that's appropriate that if, because essentially, in this unique aspect, the council president serves as a department head, a city department head, and, the, and only in this situation, not even when it comes to audit. The, uh, they, the, the president signs off on their timesheets and everything else um, and approves uh, purchases and the like, um, but only in that circumstance and that's it. And that's why that existed, but I, I you're absolutely right. It's the only appointed position, as far as I know, in the city that doesn't require uh, council approval. So I think that that's appropriate. Uh, parliamentarian thing, I just think it's in the council's best interest going forward that they at least have, in the past, what we've done, we relied on some council members who profess to have parliamentary process in mind. It turned out one of them didn't have a clue. 
and but and it's a leap of faith. It's it's also if it's a counselor who's a parliamentarian it's vesting a certain authority in them as the final word that may be influenced by their um, their own political agendas. So it's it makes sense that if you have a parliamentarian, it would be someone who actually is a essentially an employee who is, uh, this, whose purpose is to serve the council um, in all matters related to council business. And Laura is a superstar when it comes to that. In fact, uh, predating Laura, there were only been two administrative assistants was Pam Powers. And the two of them essentially defined the position as they worked it out because, the, as I said, we didn't have... We didn't have an adequate job description and those positions started to become defined by their very good work and their energies that they devoted to this. So, um, and this rule was made after the fact, after we had actually, I think, yeah, this rule was made after we even had Laura. So yeah, it's, I, I, I don't think it's inappropriate to tinker with it, but there's, there's a historical context for it anyway. Al. Al, yeah. Thanks, Rachel. It's very odd calling you Rachel here. Um, but I, I appreciate the egalitarian spirit. I really do. Um, uh, there's another another side to this I want to bring up, which is basically you're putting an employee in a position to disagree with their employer. Um, and that's a power relationship that um, can be very difficult for an employee. Um, you certainly should have a parliamentarian. I mean, it's, that's a, it's a common and routine thing for bodies to select someone to be the, the rule person. Uh, in my experience, typically it's a member of the body, but um, I would just suggest that it shouldn't be an employee. The employee shouldn't have to make a ruling that affects the decision-making of their boss. That, that, that could be tough. Ezekiel, then Bill. Um, one thing we, that could happen in that way is the council could elect a parliamentarian um, and that person could be tasked with knowledge of Robert's Rules of Order, whether they have it beforehand or they agree to learn it. I mean, it's, um, you know, I think you're, it does, they could have bias, but so could anyone. And I think at least if they were sort of appointed in that role, maybe part of that description would be to, you know, make parliamentary decisions clear of bias as much as is possible, clear of conscious bias. Um, I don't know. That would be one way to sort of solve that piece of things. Um, I agree about the appointment process piece. Karen. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, do I have... Bill on, Karen, I'll let, why don't you go first and then uh, Bill. I froze for a second, so I, yeah. I, I don't need to jump the line either. Um, so one, one point, Al, your point is well taken where there's a position of, you know, an employee potentially being in that position of needing to disagree with the employer. Um, you know, I hear that. I think one of the things I want to say or name a dynamic that I see is that Laura often she has such a solid grasp of, of parliamentary procedure. Um, but I think the other thing that can happen is when you're a member of a body that's deliberating, that takes a lot of mental energy, um, tracking, tracking the discussion, tracking what's going on, tracking your own participation. Um, and you know, a benefit that Laura or a different person in this role has is they go they go to more meetings than I do. They go to more meetings than any other counselor because they're a part of, um, you know, they're, they're taking the minutes at all the council committees, all the council meetings, the select committees. Um, and so just by, by that very presence, um, you know, has, is going to have that kind of uh, really daily experience with that procedure. And then also they're on the spot taking minutes, but they're not necessarily their brain isn't necessarily going in this other direction around what the deliberations are. And so I'm not, I'm not necessarily attached to it. That's just something that I see. And it's a role that I see Laura feel very adequately. And I know thinking about 
and again, this is only me, but to think about trying to be a parliamentarian on top of a really adequate full participation and discussion sounds sounds like a lot, but somebody uh, somebody who's more experienced absolutely could do that. But for a newer member of the body, I think that would be a very a, a big challenge. Bill. Um, I agree with Karen. And I think that um, I appreciate the sensitivity that, that Al's referring to, but the fact is, is that um, there are any other, there are any number of other points that there might be uh, set up a situation where a staff member would be in conflict with their employer. Their employer actually is, I mean, in this respect, also enjoys the protection of the other members of the body, as it were. If, if, if there were to be a pissing contest on a rather relative to parliamentary procedure between the chair and um, the administrative assistant, I, I'm not sure, I think there's enough protection there. And the ultimate protection is there is Robert's Rules of Order that can actually directly refer to in print an order as it's listed. And one of our rules is that we will abide by those principles except uh, in, in the main, except for where the rules differ. And in that respect, I think the protections offered, I understand that it's possibly awkward. There is a potential for awkwardness, but usually parliamentary questions come up and you probably, this is probably true where you served that the questions are essentially, you know, can we table this? Can we postpone this? Uh, was that point of order out of line? Um, something along that line, it's not, it doesn't speak to the item that's being addressed. It's, it doesn't take a political side about um, uh, any particular issue. It is in fact actually supposed to be free of all of that. That's what, why Robert's Rules of Order is, is uh, used as the, as the template. Um, we, um, the, when having, Back, back, again, I sound like the old timer, but the, what we used to do actually, the council meetings didn't have an administrative assistant. So some poor sucker in that meeting got through the short straw and had to keep the minutes. And as a result, there was no template. There was no rhyme or reason. No minutes comported with other minutes. Laura has a fluency and let's speak about the position rather than the person actually, I think it's more appropriate. Um, the administrative assistant has, as Karen pointed out, as a fluency of process, there is, there is a, 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 a continuum of uh, design protocol and the minutes read in the same way all the time. Um, and, and a knowledge that covers all the meetings that they end up um, providing minutes for. Back in the day, as I said, uh, it depended on who the counselor was who pulled that short straw, we would have to keep the minutes. Sometimes it was literally about four lines long. And sometimes, it, rarely, it was as exhaustive and complete as to what we get from Laura and before that with Pam. I, I think that this is not a, I don't think it's a stretch to ask this of an employee who will actually sit and essentially, you know, be in the position surviving many of the counselors, the elected officials as they turn over and change. Um, and that kind of continuum of knowledge is helps facilitate the process, facilitate the meetings. I think by and large, people would be com quite comfortable deferring to the administrative assistant as, as uh, a parliamentarian. Um, I know I am much more than I was when we had certain counselors who were presiding over it because the, there really was no, the, there were issues that came up with that that made it problematic. In the main, in the end, you know, no skin off my nose. I, I don't, you know, however you guys play it out and feel most comfortable with it, but I think this one's actually not, shouldn't be that difficult. I'm gonna weigh in and um, I, I actually, I agree with Al that um, the, position of administrative assistant should be weighed in by all the counselors when, in, the, in the hiring process. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I hear you about the, I'm holding, what I'm holding is, um, I'm uh, interested in a larger sense in kind of the job of 
uh, the administrative assistant and Laura's experience with it, because I think it's changed radically. And I'm not sure it's going back, you know, since the pandemic and there's new, you know, and, and for example, public comment going up and then so minute taking going up. So I'm trying to, I want to, I want to hold what Laura shared that it kind of seemed it's a, you know, it can be a burden to play that role of parliamentarian. So I, but I do think it's a role that needs to be played by someone and that's the conversation we could have. Um, the reason is, yeah, my sense is that that could be an, a, a difficult dynamic and kind of if it's based on, you know, if it's another counselor and there's, you know, it's really based on something a little tentative, like who has, you know, who thinks they have the most experience or who gets in the weeds. I don't know. It seems like that could, could go well or could go wrong. And, um, but I, I think in terms of encouraging new demographics to run for council and serve on council, I think it's an, it, it can act as an intimidation factor, especially for, for busy folks who, you know, don't, don't have time to, to go to sleep for Robert's rules every night. So I think it's a role that needs to be played. And um, I don't know if, you know, I think the role in general of counselors seems to me has expanded. I think our, our constituents are, um, are very engaged and are asking for, you know, a fair amount from our, from counselors these days. So, you know, I don't know if it's something, you know, Al, we met with your friend, uh, who was versed in Robert's rules. And I was thinking, can we have someone like on retainer or somebody who just plays that role? I just think I really like the idea of kind of someone who seems clearly objective. Uh, so I don't, that might be something to consider. Is this something we want to budget for to have someone kind of as needed? But I do think we need somewhere to, you know, or we need to invest in training for the council and the administrative assistant around formal training because you get on, you, you get on, on council and there's nobody there. Uh, to, you know, anyone else except for Laura. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Laura. And then I should say, you know, I I'm happy to continue doing it too and never considered that it wouldn't be an appropriate uh, role for the administrative assistant. And I also do avail myself of calling um, the city solicitor ahead of time if we anticipate, like when we have someone has a conflict of interest and you might have a complicated um, process for dealing with that. So, you know, I have that resource to draw on if I know in advance a question will arise. Yeah, um, Alan and Karen. Yeah, um, I do expect that um, any appeal to parliamentarian is extremely rare. Um, I mean, honestly, if the council fully utilized the rules that existed now, um, it would be operating a little bit differently than it does. So, I mean, it's incumbent upon people to actually get to know what the rules are. Um, and it's only an appeal to Robert's rules if the council rules themselves are, are silent on an issue, right? Um, so if you wanna have the administrative assistant stay in this position, then I think as the employer, uh, you should be paying for training for your employee, whether it's for the entire council or whether it's for the employee that you are making um, this function part of the job, the employer has a responsibility to ensure that the employee uh, has the right information to be able to make um, the right decisions. Um, I wouldn't change a rule over that. I would just, if, if you end up deciding that you wanna leave the rule as it is, I just think, you know, the council as an employer ought to do that um, to help their employee do the job. Karen. I actually have more of a point of order, um, but with this agenda item, here and a person serving in the role also as a part of this meeting. I'm wondering if we should recognize Laura and, and bring Laura, Laura more formally into the conversation. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds like a good idea. Okay, so That's I move what? to recognize Laura. Second. Okay, Laura, please take the role. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, Councilor Mayori. Yes. Vice Chair Simon. I'm sorry, what are we voting on? We're voting on whether to recognize Laura. A little late. I don't. <laughs> yeah, I don't Generally, know. when someone is not a, a standing member, we have to vote to recognize them so that they can um, speak, uh, go and have a back and forth with. Okay, that's, that's not the prerogative just of the chair. You need the, the whole committee to do it. Then I In vote the 
Member Baskin. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes, and just to clarify, Laura, I'm really glad you jumped in. I was just wanting to formalize that if we wanted to, to have more of a back and forth with you. Thank you, Karen. I appreciate you doing that. That makes sense. Ezekiel. I did have a question on that note, um, Laura, for you, if it's if you're open to it, which is just, do you feel like there's anything significant responsibilities of your role that aren't included in this list or things in this list mm -hmm. that you do don't ever do? Like there's anything in this list that's not really part of your job? Well, I hadn't thought about anything that I do that's not included, but I know that there was one rule that 2.5.1.6, I think it is, um, that's to secure two video recordings of the city council meeting. And I was gonna talk about that, just that, um, you know, I was wondering where that came from and I, if whether that was a state regulation or something, because, oh, Bill, it's council, Bill seems to have the answer to that, but. Well, a lot has changed actually when this was established, but yes, the, in fact, actually the video recordings used to be done by um, North, well, be, before it was called Northampton Open Media, Northampton Community Television was the official minutes they served as the official minutes by state law in fact there had to be some video record along with the written minutes that corresponded now of course um, when we first discussed this it was still being done on videotape um, and that was hence securing the videotapes one went to forbes library and one stayed in the record um it, forbes library so the public could see it now, of course, it's on YouTube. Now it's digitally stored and um, and there is no official designated spot for it to reside. It's it's with the contract that we have with NAM right now and they have it and there is their YouTube site. But should that pass, and the state has not answered us on this, I don't know if there are any particular queries, but what, what do we do now that things are stored in a cloud or stored in a particular account if you want to reference those videos before there was a physical videotape that doesn't exist anymore. And so this rule does not make any sense. Really. Laura. I actually, actually asked IT and they actually do have a storage space for it that um, Frank Forbes showed me. And he said that there's, and I have not been doing this assignment of putting the recordings there. They were put there consistently up through 2016, but he's going to install this clip grabber, it's called, on my computer that will allow me to take the YouTube recording and put it in this designated place. So there is a place now other than just, you know, NOM's own archives. There's a place in the city. So, but I was just going to suggest we have one recording because it's not a state requirement at all. I actually called the state archivist who said that the the retention records for municipal documents only requires the recording to be kept until the official minutes are approved or until the administrative use ceases. So there is no requirement, you know, in state law that that recording be kept. It's just our own for our own purposes. So, but, so, but one should be enough. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um. Once upon a time, we were talking about this transition to media changes that, uh, and also to create accessibility to the public. Um, there was consideration to uh, to have the administrative assistant actually uh, tag various points in the in the actually at each agenda item, tag it on the video so that people wouldn't have to watch the entire meeting to get to each agenda. Um, that's, and that was supposedly, but that was the old IT person was from SI Kendo was going to help with that. Pam was going to try and work it out. We never got beyond that actually, as far as I know. I mean, I think personally, I mean, there is technology that exists that makes that easier, but I don't know. I don't want to put another thing on the administrative assistance plate. That's entirely up to the future council. But the fact is, is that I think that would improve uh, people's access immeasurably to be able to to find the video chapter that they're particularly interested in and not have to en endure what we have to endure because we took it on. <laughs> um, 
Uh, Karen. Oh, and then Laura. Just a hearty second to that bill. Um, you know, as it, as the technology exists and as we we develop the bandwidth and capacity for it, I so frequently send residents clips of videos from our meetings in answer to their questions so that they, you know, I can summarize it in a sentence or two, but then to give them the backstory. Um, and so I do the searching and then queue up the video and send it to them. And, and I don't mind doing that. Um, but if the technology exists to match the recordings to the agenda items, um, gosh, game changer, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Al. Wait, Laura, did you have your hand up? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Laura. I think yeah, so my request for that one rule would just be to change the two to one in the number of recordings. Just yeah, clarify what the. Yeah, I bring good news to the rest of you because the technology does in fact exist because that's what we was used in Windsor, Connecticut. We outsourced, we outsourced that piece to a company. I forget their name. And they kept the recording. It was always available on the town's website and it was always matched up to the agenda. So if you just wanted to see item six, you pressed item six on the agenda, went to that part of the video. So that's already existing and there's there really is no need for a, a city employee to have to manually do any of that. Right. I just wanna make a point of clarification out um, that um, I, when, because uh, Karen put a motion on the floor, I felt we needed a roll call, but I, you might be right that as a, as a subcommittee, as chair, I have the purview of, of recognizing people without a roll call. And we can talk a little bit more about that our next agenda item, but just to clarify, because a motion was on the floor, I, that's why I did that. Um, so yeah, but any, uh, so any other thoughts on um, the administrative assistant, Bill? Oh, muted. Uh, hit, hit the mic, yeah. Actually, to, to Laura's point, um, I don't see, I think you could actually delete item six. Um, mm -hmm. That because right now, and we, and to, to add, this ties in with what Al was saying, we could actually, we should follow up with Al Williams of NAM, but to see, I, I'm pretty sure that they have the means to do that for us. And then if we designate whoever has the contract for the, the PEG contract, the public education government contract would be the people who provide that service and be the keepers of the video as it were. Um, it's, it, it shouldn't be on Laura. Laura never sees the video. Laura doesn't touch the video. She has no, she can't control or manage the video. It doesn't, it shouldn't fall on the administrative assistant anymore. As I said, this only existed when it was on cassette tape. So I happen to know personally, there are no cassette tapes anymore. So I, I would actually move to delete that. Okay. So there's a second motion on the floor. That's that's a motion to delete 2.5.1.6. Correct. And Is that Rachel, Council Mayori who seconded it? Was that Rachel who seconded it? Uh, no, it was Ezekiel. Thank you. Did you want to me to roll yes, call? Yes, let's do it. I was just saying, there's, yes, roll, roll call, please. Rachel. Yes. Al. Yes. Ezekiel. Yes. Bill. Yes. Karen. Yes. Okay. Sounds like we, uh, yes, Al. Madam Rachel. Uh, I wanted to make an, uh, another um, motion in line with the earliest discussion. Uh, pertaining to council ratification of the uh, administrative assistance appointment. So uh, this is pertaining to rule 2.3.7. I'm gonna read what's there and then I'll make the motion. Uh, I'm just gonna to add to it. So it currently reads, this is under um, uh, duties of the council president, to hire the administrative assistant to the city council and to supervise the individual in that position. So my motion is to add to that to say um, um, the, the uh, administrative assistant appointment must be ratified by the full city council. Second. Okay, roll call. Who was the second? I'm sorry, I'm not. Uh, Bill. No, thank you. Okay. Um, Rachel. Yes. Al. 
Yes. Ezekiel. Yes. Bill. Yes. And Karen. Yes. Okay, that passes. May I ask one more thing? Yes. Um, I just uh, just want to find out where people are at with the idea of eliminating parliamentarian role from the admin. If people aren't there, obviously there's not going to be a motion, but I think that's where the discussion is, but we could just wrap it up by letting me know where people are at with that. Bill. It'd be my preference to keep it where it is. Uh, Karen. Yeah. Yeah. The same. Else? Um, with, with, until we have a plan for it to go somewhere else, I'm hesitant also to remove it. But I take your point and Laura's point. Uh, Ezekiel. Yeah, I think it's um, sort of would note it as something for the council to keep an eye on and revisit if they find themselves using a parliamentarian more. Um, but I don't think right now it needs to be changed. Perhaps that could be a more nuanced recommendation. Uh, uh, Laura. I just have one other picky little change. If we're, yeah, please. This is the time. That one, the 2.5.1.5 1. 5 says to ensure that all documents addressed to the council shall be provided to each counselor and become part of the record of council meeting at which the documents are distributed. Since the documents are no longer distributed at council meetings, yeah. I was just going to make the change to the second part of that sentence and say, you know, ensure that the, all documents will be provided to each counselor and that any documents reviewed during the meeting become part of the permanent public record of that meeting instead of, you know, a reference to documents being distributed since uh, so, so that would cover any documents that are distributed but also cover meeting documents just simply screen shared during the meeting. Ezekiel. I move to adopt the language that Laura just proposed. I second and by way of discussion I would uh, say Bill. that I so I do second that and by way of discussion I would also say that this is actually a dream that I had when I first got elected was to become paperless. We used to receive uh, by city courier, which doesn't really exist anymore either, a, a big fat manila envelope filled with the paper uh, agenda and all the subsequent documents. It was, it was wasteful. It was, uh, you know, I know of some counselors who profess to have a garage filled with those documents. I doubt it, but they said they did. And essentially, you know, we, we eradicated a forest every time we, we had these papers distributed to us. This is much better. It also provides the, the problem with doing the printable uh, documents was there were members of the public who requested, but not many. Most of them were reports and they had to be sent out to them in a timely fashion as well. But that also excluded a lot of other people who didn't have the wherewithal of the knowledge that they could ask for the, all those documents. Now they have access on their own to go seek out those documents online. He does, he, he, Laura will print them up if requested and she still receives requests. Um, but as such, this is, this is another issue where the technology, we finally caught up with the technology or it caught up with us and that we are now almost genuinely paperless. And I think that is a great accomplishment. And I think any rule that remains as a vestigial tail should be addressed. And I thank you, Laura, for proposing. Oh. Al. Um, this is really just a point of information on this. So my, my only concern would be that, um, that this process would somehow not make all the documents that are part of an agenda uh, not available to the public in some manner. So uh, if we could talk about that, because if you want to deal electronically, that of course that makes sense now, but they but those have to be available, uh, easily available electronically, the same documents to the public. Um, it, it's probably also a good practice when you go back to having in-person meetings 
that you have two or three printed copies for people who show up so they can see what's going on. Um, but, as, but as long as all the documents that are going to the council or that the council considers uh, can be assured to be still available to the public, I'm, I'm fine with all of this. They are required by law to be available to the public in, in print and, and electronically. So, the, um, and in fact, actually, it's still the archives, which are not particularly well preserved in a dank basement in City Hall or um, where those reside right now, which is why electronically they're more robust, more accessible, um, and can be available for immediate printing. Uh, whereas none of this technology existed 10 years ago and like this rule is 10 years old. So I, I, I think, in fact, we have expanded the public's access to these documents a thousand fold from what they used to be. You, used to, you have to used to jump through a lot of hoops to get them. And it was a pain in the butt. And now I think we're in a much better place. Laura. Yeah, I was just going to make the same point that the open meeting law requires um, the body to list all of the documents that are reviewed during the meeting. So all of the official versions of the minutes contain a list of all the documents reviewed. And those documents don't necessarily have to be kept with the minutes, but they are kept somewhere on file. Mm -hmm. So they would all be available to the public. Thank you. And the public would know what they are even because they're the list is attached to the official minutes. Okay, any other comments on this motion that's on the floor? Um, we had a second, per, correct? Okay, Bill, Bill was a second. So roll call on the motion to change the, the wording. To remove the, yes. Al. Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> um, Al. You're muted. Al. Al's still lag. muted. I'm yeah. having a lag. There we go. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, Ezekiel. Yes. Bill. Yes. And Karen. Yes. So the motion passes. Um, if any other uh, issues related to this agenda item, including Laura, if there's anything, you know, I keep wondering about the changes over the last year with the remote and, and when we go back and the hybrid situation, and if there's something you think needs, needs to change in the description of your duties or in the balance of your work, I'm just curious. No, the only thing was the rule that says the administrative assistant staffs all of the subcommittees and select committees. The only thing that could be problematic is if there were a lot of select committees at any one time. It's you know it's possible to support Lagging one or two, but, um, or one even. But so that if there were any like discussion or consideration of a different arrangement being made for select committees, if and when they're formed. Yeah. yeah. That actually that was a concern when this rule was drafted or when the when the job description was created. I mean, because there were opportunities where that could be complicated. What one of the things that I would recommend is and what we did in the past, <laughs> I keep saying that. What we did in the past was we actually had to rely on the mayor's office to provide some staff member to cover in, in circumstances that uh, you know, if you had two meetings going out at the same time, the administrative assistant certainly couldn't be there. And we still do that at some level. Uh, at this point, uh, for instance, Pam Powers serves as uh, the administrative assistant on ranked choice voting discussion. Um, um, and that was a natural fit in the past. Uh, Any Lesko uh, for charter review um, out of the mayor's office. It, 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 it was basically understood, although it's not prescribed, uh, that the, uh, replacements could be approved and appointed to serve instead of the administrative assistant. But we have, as I said, there's no official remark on that. So actually by these rules, 
of someone's a violation when Lord can't attend 16 meetings in one night. So um, I don't know if you want to address that by the rules or continue doing what we've been doing. Thoughts? I mean, I don't know if we could change the language to somebody's got to do it. <laughs> I don't know if the budget allows for, you know, if, if it was really explode, like the work exploded, if council can get some sort of temporary help with that, if that's happened in the past. And by the way, Bill, I find these, the framework that you bring really invaluable, actually, because it helps me understand how we got someplace and, and question, you know, whether when when and whether to change those things but um so that's a possibility to, to look at the language to yes laura you could just add the words select committees if assigned or as assigned you know to the existing language as assigned i could i mean to read what it yeah. helps if i read the language i don't know sure um because 2.5.1.2 says two. now to provide staff oh i could i could screen share this um, okay. Oops. Um, to provide staff support and record keeping to all standing standing council committees and select committees as assigned, and to assist committees with all aspects of reporting or select committees if assigned. I was trying to somehow indicate. No, that big yeah. Select yeah. committees yeah. portion was right uh, optional exactly, but um, got discretionary. it. <laughs> Yeah, got it. I would, I would offer that as a motion. Uh, Al. Uh, before we get to that, I wanted to I wanted to bring up the thought that the city council really should consider hiring um, an additional, <laughs> probably part time person uh, to to do these meetings. Um, the administrative assistant is supposed to be working eight to four, eight to five, whatever, but she has to cover every one of these meetings. And so I'm sure she's, she with the council president, extremely flexible with those hours, but it's still an extremely inconsistent and uh, in many cases, very long work weeks that I don't think should be. And I, I think more help is needed, particularly the staff meetings. So that's not that's not a rule issue, obviously, but I would hope that the, the council would consider that. So we have a motion on the floor. No second yet. No second. 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 Okay. Discussion. Uh, Karen. Laura, could you do me a favor? I have a hard time taking in a lot of audio information on, on like trying to get language. Would you mind repeating what you had said with that rule? Sure. Um, to provide staff support and record keeping to all standing council committees and select committees as assigned is the addition and to assist committees with all aspects of reporting. Okay. Did that help? So it, it did. And I, I would offer for a friendly amendment to your amendment. It's, I think the word, I was getting stuck on the first all. So I wonder if we wanna to say to provide staff support and record keeping to standing council committees and select committees as assigned and to assist committees with all aspects of reporting. I guess it was the first all that made it sound like you would be at every council committee and select committee. And so I, I just grammatically, I wonder if that's clearer or not and I'm, I'm not attached to it. I would accept that as a friendly amendment to the motion. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't pick up on the change from... Were you, it's a very were, subtle one, Laura. Um, so I'll, I'll read it again. To provide staff support and record keeping to, and this is where you would cross out the all. So to provide staff support and record keeping to standing council committees and select committees as assigned and to, assist committee, and to assist committees with all aspects of reporting. So it's just that... Um, Got it. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So no more further discussion, then roll call on this motion to change the language. Rachel. Yes. 
Al. Yes. Ezekiel. Yes. Bill. Yes. And Karen. Yes. The motion passes. Laura, for some reason, when you call my name, my first name during roll call, I, I get startled and think uh, there's something. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, oh, yes, we're voting. I don't know what it is the change between Rachel and Councillor Mayori, but um, Rachel Sipstraight. Maybe that's something like that. Some ancient voice um, telling me to do something else. Uh, let's see. So, okay. So this is have we exhausted this uh, topic regarding the council admin assistant or is there any further dis um, concerns or discussion on this agenda item? Okay, so moving on, possible, the next agenda item is possible uh, changes to rule 4.13.2 votes required to pass measures slash roll call votes. Al. All right, so this is me again. So um, 4.13.2 lists uh, one, two, three uh, items specifically where it describes the amount of votes it takes to pass certain things. Sometimes it's six, sometimes it's five, but it requires uh, roll calls of each of them. Um, and I know that, you know, during the pandemic, you have to do roll calls, but the, there, I believe there will come a point where you don't have to do it for everything anymore. I think actually uh, roll calls are un, just slow things down unnecessarily um, and shouldn't be required in any case because uh, the presiding officer uh, can ask for a roll call vote if a vote is not clear. And the current rules also state that any member may request a roll call vote for any question before the city council. So the ability to, to, to do roll calls uh, will continue to exist on an as needed basis um, and not be a function of requirement for certain types of votes. So my suggestion is to remove the requirement for roll call from each of those. And then the second part of this topic was um, the method of recording the roll call vote because, and I don't know if you're doing this now because it seems kind of burdensome to do it this way, but the way it states in 4.13.3.2 method of recording says the first roll call vote shall be in alphabetical order, but each roll call vote after that shall progress to the next city councilor in the alphabet uh, so that at the end of every nine roll calls, each councilor has an alphabetical, alphabetical progression voted first in one of the nine roll calls. Now that just seems extraordinarily complicated for no good reason. And I would just suggest that you conduct your roll call votes in alphabetical order. Uh, Karen, did you raise, have your hand raised? I was no. actually adjusting the temperature in my room, but, oh, um, okay. but I, I, um, I, I will defer. I'll, well, actually, no, I'll, I'll go ahead since I'm here. Go um, for it. Yeah. <laughs> and let me just announce uh, that I'm having bad internet. So if you lose me, I, I, I'll take over if I, I go away. Okay. Um, as, go ahead. Um, I, you know, I, I guess, L, hearing you talk, I know the roll calls are burdensome. And I think there are a lot of places where we, um, in accordance with state law, um, exactly which ones require and don't require roll calls to make sure we're compliant with that. There, there certainly are votes though, where I think um, the public want, sort of deserves for transparency's sake to see that the councilor vote one by one rather than listening to the I or, you know, the yes or no or the, the I or nay and, and kind of trying to parse it out through there. So I would, I would you know, I, I, I would need to look to verify state law bill, I suspect you know off the tip of your tongue. Um, and then I know the that's interesting um, you brought up about the alphabetical order. When you read that paragraph, it's a total mouthful. It is how we do our votes in council meetings. And um, you know, I, I actually really like it um, because it's depending on the order or, or what's happening, um, you know, there's certain pressures that fall with where your vote lies. And um, it feels relatively egalitarian to be voting first at some points and last at others. And um, I, I always track where I'm going to be on my next vote. Uh, Bill. Um, 
It's true, actually. There, there's some of this is prescribed, particularly relevant to zoning laws, and that, that, that defines the proportion of the vote, whether it's a majority or a supermajority, and so on. The roll call, um, the affinity for roll calls is essentially uh, a desire to make the councilors own their vote instead of losing themselves in a, in a voice vote where they can actually pretend they didn't vote that way, um, even though it is law. The, the alphabetical order actually was something that I bumped into when, when I first got elected. And, and for the same reasons as Karen, I found it actually refreshing because it really, and, and you probably experienced this in Windsor too, uh, there are people who will, you know, they want to know how the person in front of them is voting or whether they're, you know, if they're doing vote counting on a divided question, they want to see, one of the things that you would see frequently is somebody who uh, basically wanted to approve an item, but wanted to be reflected as voting against, but trying to determine whether their anti-vote would um, would defeat the measure, in which case they they their cute maneuver would be thwarted. That kind of put the kibosh on that kind of behavior and conduct in the council made in and, and I, I actually think contributes to the honesty of the vote. You have to own your vote. It's tagged to you. And I mean now you'll see some people use abstentions that way. Um, I haven't seen it with this council. I've seen it with past councils, but um, and or pass and wait to see how the rest of the people vote. That's another process by which they're allowed to do. Um, but actually, I have no, I have no, uh, I have no problem with uh, that particular rule. The other issue about the roll call, though, is going to become problematic. And I don't know where the state's going to fall on this. But if we do come back, we, I'm sorry, you guys come back in a hybrid form, there has to be. Um, some clear recognition as to who, you know, if someone's participating remotely, you'd have to represent their vote, not just with a, an I or an A, um, with a group, because it's, you're going to, whoever's presiding is going to have to determine what was said online versus what was said in the room. And I think it, in the state may have some ruling on that or not. In the end, in the main, yes. I mean, in fact, actually, before COVID, we, we breezed right along because we had lots of voice votes and um and i've only recalled two incidents in my entire tenure where someone called now well, more than that uh for a roll call after a voice vote um on it i mean usually what happens is if it looks like it's going to be a close divided vote someone counselor will call for a roll call or the presiding officer will because simply so they make an accurate count um, so I'm, I'm okay one way or the other. I think that if you, if one, I think there's, uh, it, this is worth checking with the solicitor and maybe Laura knows, but I think there are certainly prescribed uh, types of vote that require a, voice, a, a roll call vote. And then others that are voice vote, that's, that's subject to discretion, as you point out. So I, 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 either way, I'm not too, I'm not too hung up on it. Thank you. I feel I as don't experience the alphabet swapping as burdensome, and I think it is kind of elegant, even though it is a mouthful on the page. So I, I agree with that piece. I think something that I would want in a perfect world, but recognize it might not be possible for the council would be instead of roll call voting, to have that kind of voting where people simultaneously vote yes or no, but it is recorded individually. So like voting with buttons where you, each person marks their yes or no at the same time. Cause I do think that when you vote in roll call, people are influenced by the votes of the people before them. I think that the sort of cycling through the alphabet thing makes it so the same people aren't going first all the time, which is better. But I, I'm always curious, like, how would everybody vote if they couldn't know everybody else's votes ahead of time? Like, that's the thing I would like to see, because I think it would create even more honest voting than what we have currently. I don't know if that's possible, given all the requirements around state law here, but I'm, I'm sharing what I think would be ideal in my mind. Uh, um, 
That's a great, that's a great idea. I've really always wanted a, a buzzer button. I've, I've told my fellow counselors that, especially for seconding. Um, Bill, I think you had, did you, is your hand still up or did you? Okay, Al? Yeah, I guess I would say if uh, if you want the accountability for votes, then you really should require that every vote be a be a roll call, right? That that the current practice required by the state, you should codify into your rules to make every vote a roll call vote. Um, I, you know, it, people are going to be influenced by whatever influences them, right? And, but if you've got if you've got city council people who don't know how they're going to vote at the time of the vote and will be influenced by the vote of the person before them, gosh, I really think they should find something else to do with their time. Uh, Karen. You know, um, I, I think voice votes for a lot of um, a lot of what we're doing work well, um, especially the more perfunctory, you know, for consent agenda. Um, uh, I'm blanking on the adjournment, um, you know, some of some of those. But, you know, Elle, like, gosh, there was a meeting. Maybe a year ago early on where the way the alphabet worked, I was the first or second counselor to vote and it was on an adjournment and I voted no because I didn't feel we were quite done. And other counselors followed up and voted no, where if we'd all been voting at the same, but it was like that opportunity. And that was a really unique case and we can't write a rule for that, but that was actually an opportunity that um, that maybe a little persuasion was was helpful in that one thing because what counselor votes no on adjournment right so like it just kind of was was a cue but then most things or, or you know I certainly wouldn't write a rule for that I just I, I found that to be an interesting example and there there are only a couple of votes where I knew how I was going to vote but it was still you know hearing the one by one was in informational and sort of speaking the vote and owning the vote and very publicly owning the vote as a roll call vote. So um, it, it, it has its role, um, although certainly I think voice, voice votes when we are able to do them again, um, have a lot of value for speeding up the, move, the meeting. Yeah, I just want to comment that I remembered that, uh, that woke me up, Karen. And in that case, it was, that was helpful because my thought was, if a fellow counselor doesn't feel like this is done, then I'm fine staying. So it was a, almost like a relational vote. <laughs> but um, I know, I think uh, uh, Bill can go, but I also wanted to, I think Al had mentioned something about adjournment and not needing roll call votes at some point. But let, let's hear from Bill and then I can follow up. What I actually, what I'd like to do is uh, ask Laura. Laura, what, do you, what is your understanding of, of state law requirements for roll calls, particularly in issues of zoning and finance? I know state law requires a certain number of votes, like a supermajority for the zoning ordinances appropriations. I don't know whether they're required to be roll calls. <laughs> so that, I've got to follow up and ask the city solicitor. Um, I also just want to say that on a practical note, I think when we go back to hybrid in person, uh, my hunch is that there will most regularly be counselors um, participating remotely. So then I just was trying to picture the, the switching back and forth. Um, and if that would just be confusing for the public, if, yeah, just that. Um, but I do, um, you know, I do think roll call takes up a lot of time and it can be redundant um, or feel that way. Al. Uh, based on what I'm hearing, you should probably just leave the rules alone in this regard, because um, once we get past the pandemic, um, you are not required to do roll calls for everything, and, and any counselor has the right to ask for one in a situation where it isn't already required. So, mm -hmm. gotcha. um, but, but let me just come back to this um, issue of the adjournment and voting no. Every motion should have a discussion option. And I would think that's where you'd, you'd have your discussion of, I, I really don't think we're done yet. We shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, adjourn. And you can, you can hear from discussion where things are going, which is why I never made a motion, right? On that prior issue regarding the parliamentarian, because I, I could hear the discussion. I wanted to be sure about it. 
But the discussion was, no, people aren't on board with that. So that's the end of it. Um, so maybe there's, in the meetings, just need to be sure that there's always a discussion factor for the motion, because that's the opportunity to persuade each other through comment. Bill. I, I think, but I'm not sure that the um, requirement of no debate on an adjournment motion is actually part of Robert's rules of order. Um, worth checking. I might defer to the parliamentarian, but I think that. Uh, that, that is correct. Is, I actually checked that. Yeah. It is correct. Yeah. They're, they're it's not, a non debatable not, motion. And as such, what, what you had was in, in, in Karen's case, you had a council that's more than willing to accommodate someone who was um, prepared to vote no. And, you know, there may be a more contentious council coming down the pike somewhere in the future that might not be so accommodating, but there it is. It's, it's embedded in the rules in the, in Roberts anyway. So I think, I mean, another important point is I think when you all and the new counselors uh, convene, the first thing you do, one of the first things you do in your first meeting is to vote on the rules. Um, and as such, the meeting will, in all likelihood, be a hybrid version. Uh, we, we agreed not to convene anymore in, in place and only do it remotely until the next term starts. And at that point, it would be up to that council to decide what makes the most sense, I think, relative to those rules of uh, voting and what challenges are presented by trying to manage a hybrid meeting and so on and so forth. And, you know, work out the bugs as you go. Also, the rules are subject to change and can be voted and changed um, if, if the problem presents itself and the rules run counter to that solution. So I'm just saying that, that I, I take your point and I think those are good thoughts worth holding on to by uh, those of you who will be returning for this conversation. And, and it would certainly expedite a meeting to have less roll call votes and it's been so long I've forgotten. And I have to say that, you know, they would annoy the bejesus out of me. They would have to roll. That's why you actually, this amount of roll call votes actually deters people making motions in some cases I've noticed that people are a little reluctant to go through that just to have a, a rather simple motion to address. So, you know, for instance, the recognition of Laura's for instance and stuff. So. So you guys will have a chance to sit with this for a little while and see what works best for you as going forward. Uh, Ezekiel. There should also be a lot less roll call votes without second readings optimistically. So that would be helpful too in speeding up the meetings. Yeah, and I just want to say it will be really interesting, you know, in April we'll, we'll get um, we'll get the, the new um, laws reviewed by the state in terms of remote meetings, possibly about roll call. And if it's gonna be a semi-permanent situation, I, who knows what the state will require of us or not require of us. And um, and maybe the technology will get to Ezekiel's suggestion. Maybe, you know, if it's going to become a kind of semi-permanent way of, of being that there will be new you know, new Zoom button to push, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, but just to say that, you know, things are all, this particular issue is probably going to come up again in April for the new council in some form. So any more thoughts on this uh, or emotions on this possible changes to the roll call? Court, move on. If not, let's move on. Uh, to possible changes to the decorum clause. Um, yeah. Let me tell you, I, I can almost anticipate Al's concerns about this one, but it, it, the, this was thrown in as, it wasn't you, okay? <laughs> it wasn't, no, was, yeah. it, it became, uh, what happened was that, in fact, according to the solicitor and, and the ACLU, there are certain constraints that we tried to put on a meeting in order you know, to maintain civility and decorum in the council chambers. Um, <laughs> yeah. a, a good reputation though, Al, that's, that's um, 
And so we couldn't sharply define what constituted decorum because it could be considered restrictive to uh, free expression, even if that expression included threats, uh, uh, obscene language, um, libelous or defaming. I mean, what I used to do is I would counsel people before public comment to say, you're welcome to criticize us by name, the counselors, because we're public figures. We identify as such, we ran, and you can say whatever you want about it, but don't speak, don't name somebody who's in the public, who is not a public figure, and start defaming them or accusing them of something in this venue. Um, and then I was told that I really couldn't do that, or I couldn't enforce it, right. which was the problem. I mean, I could recommend against it, but I couldn't enforce it. It was unenforceable. Um, decorum, you know, what the hell is that? I mean, you know, it's, you know, some people would interpret that as you have to be dressed up in a certain way, behave, or the, the Ezekiel's concerned about the deference to titles and, and the nomenclature of, 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 of the, the, the formal language that we've been living with forever. That's a form of decorum. But when I would say, basically, we threw this in to keep the honest people honest. Um, technically, we really can't, if somebody wants to uh, talk over their time limit, we're actually pretty limited as to what we can do. We can ask them to continue to, to stop. Please stop. Please stop. Your time has run out. You're, you're affecting others' ability to speak. And some people don't care about that. And, um, and they're really, there's very limited what we can do. But by trying to set a tone with this rule that you can refer to, but point of fact cannot enforce, you actually probably anticipate um, some behavior that, that might otherwise just pass as normal. And at that point would actually subvert the, the ability for the meeting to work properly and for people actually not to get fights. <laughs> so, and that's particularly when we met in public too, when someone would come to the podium and public comment section who actually had a couple of times have threatened violence and you're in the room with this person and you have no authority to call them out because you, unless you had a rule that you could refer to. Um, and what I always said that if, if you are in violation of the quorum and the chair will, it's a, the chair's discretion, we can, we will ask the cameras to be shut off and go into recess and there will be no further discussion. Hmm. That's one way you can work around it, but the fact is that that, that could be problematic too, could be subject to suit. So that's the reason this very rather ambiguous clause sits in there. Um, and it, I've never seen it abused. I've never seen a council president or any counselor abuse this to the detriment of public uh, contribution or participation. You know, technically, uh, our first Zoom meeting, we got Zoom bombed by some frisky adolescents. And then another meeting, uh, a Russian gentleman decided to share his evening's um, pleasure seeking. And technically, we can't remove them. They're public. Although they're committing an actual illegal act. The fact is, is that we have no authority to, to act on that. So it's... But we did. Uh, the council president did. She deleted him, and we haven't heard from Russia about how we've suppressed his freedom of expression. But we're vulnerable in that respect. Al. Yeah, just to clarify, this was not my agenda topic. So, <laughs> so I, uh, Laura and I decided to add this. Uh, we were thinking originally about Ezekiel's um, uh, bringing up the issue of, you know, de deferential titles. And there wasn't something, it's not really a rule. You know, it's Bill, as Bill clarified, it's really a custom. But we, we did think, um, you know, it could be related to this decorum clause. It was worth visiting. Um, yeah, I will, I will just say that uh, that reality you know, hit me when we had that, um, uh, that person 
um, make a what I consider a racial slur. And then when we checked in with the city solicitor, we were told that really there was nothing really we could do about that. And that was really frustrating. Um, and I think to some extent it, it's aspirational, but maybe considered could be considered a little disingenuous our announcing at the beginning of the meeting that you know if you don't um, you know behave properly you will be asked to leave or taken out because the truth as you say the truth is we really can't do that in a, most situations so I kind of struggle with that I, I would I think the council president probably struggles with that mm -hmm. uh, Bill there is one standing rule that has become problematic or was problematic to start with when, when public comment well, once upon a time asked people to state their names and address. You'll notice that now we actually say state your name and the town you're from. The reason being was uh, during a particular resolution of domestic violence, there were a number of women who wanted to testify but did not want to reveal where they lived or where they were um, residing, which seemed wholly appropriate. It's not, I don't think it's required by the public record that um, the person identify where they've come from. That, of course, got completely blown out of the water during uh, remote participation when we got calls from um, California and someone from England at one point who was participating in the debate, never mind Turner's Falls, uh, Chicopee, and, and other areas. Um, having them identify where the, I mean, I, in that respect, I don't know what you guys want to do going forward. Maybe having them identify from where, what town they're calling from is appropriate. This goes back to the public comment discussion. Um, but be mindful that there are some people, some people like that racist bastard who said that MAGA guy, um, he, just decided he was going to be anonymous and stay that way because he didn't have the, the courage of his racism. But there are other people who genuinely need to protect themselves uh, that stand in real risk um, by identifying their location or even expressing their opinion, and they should not be silenced. And so uh, they're in that sense of the decorum issue, uh, that's for a future council and a future council president to decide what's the best way to proceed to facilitate um, access even to racists um, uh, and bigots of all stripes. Uh, everyone, I mean, that's the nature of free expression, but how do you allow it? And how, you know, and to what extent does it become disruptive and unacceptable? And what can you do about it? Those are all the challenges before you in this rule. And, and I honestly don't see how you can modify it in such a way that it, it would make it more effective. I wish I could. Well, point of clarification, I, I was going to say that um, public hearings, there's a little bit more latitude for the council because the, the public comments have to be related to the hearing as opposed to general public comment. So that is a slightly different. Um, way of approaching it. To that, yes, because that's part of the agenda, because uh, the public comment is actually embedded in the agenda. So they have to, once they're part of the meeting, they are actually have to uh, abide by, you can speak only to the items on the agenda. You can't start talk, telling us about, you know, the dogs that scream in your head at night or something. You have to talk about this. And you, um, whereas with public comment, we're, it's a, an open forum, and that, as we discussed before, as an open forum, it, you know, we've experienced uh, transcendent moments in there where people recite poetry, done dance performances, and things like that. In fact, it, it has very little to do as a rule uh, with, with the items on the agenda or the debate points, but, and sometimes it has a lot to do with it. So, again, that's for you to define. If you are in the problem is that if if you wanted to, as we said before, if you wanted to um, uh, have that type of, of power and authority over the public comment, you have to embed it in the meeting after roll call, as opposed to having it outside. Because once it's outside, you basically you're providing a public forum 
without constraint, they're in, they're in, you just have to rely on all the people participating, uh, obey the rules as it were. Uh, thank you. So this is the kind of the thing I don't understand about the rule about public comment, the 4.8, is that if public comment is outside of the meeting and not governed by the rules of the meeting, then why do we have rules about public comment in the rules of the city council? Like it, I, I guess I'm confused. That feels like a, it feels a little muddy to me. I'm not, I'm not clear. Are you saying that the public comment is outside of the purview of the rules? Uh, Bill. I think technically, yes. Uh, it'd be worth talking more granularly with the solicitor, but yes. Essentially, what public comment is a forum that the council offers or presides over. It is, you know, in some cases when we're discussing committees, it is that opportunity for people to come speak. It's frustrating insofar as that it's not a back and forth. Um, it's not a dialogue. It's a, usually a monologue or if there are questions, they're rhetorical, they, they can't be answered. In the context of meeting, it's not on the agenda. So it is just, it was, and again, this is something that evolved, as I said, predating this charter. And yeah, I think in the main, and that's part of the solicitor's point, is that we, we have very limited authority and power over that. It's basically, we're inviting you to our house to speak. Please respect everyone when you speak. and Please keep it under three minutes and please do this. But there's no, there's no public comment jail. There's no authority that we can simply say, stop it, shut up, you can't talk. Once you open that, once you create that system, then you're very limited in, in how you can manage it. And we even technically, I think our two minutes or three minutes or we keep it for an hour and a half, it might be problematic, but we'll see it's, if, if it goes on challenge. Wow. Yeah, so there really is a glitch in the order of business for the agenda. You really should have the roll call first to basically determine do you have a legal council meeting and then you should have your public comment but um you know i see that there's in my opinion there's pretty broad discretion by the presiding officer of a meeting to run the meeting and um it's certainly true that people can say what they like but there also are probably what i would call a a community standard of of what is offensive um, whether they're attacks on people or particular words that are, are inflammatory, um, that I think the presiding officer has the right to interrupt a speaker about. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think, in my opinion, the presiding officer, if, if it continues in an ex extreme fashion, I think the presiding officer has the right to say, we're cutting you off, or you may not speak any longer, or click uh, leave meeting for them in the Zoom or, or whatever. I don't expect that that would happen with regularity, but I, I do think the presiding officer has some discretion about that mm -hmm. in their role as the person who makes sure the meeting and the agenda happens. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that, that, that was my kind of assumption as well. And, and Solicitor C, Alan, Alan Seawald, Kind of basically said no to that that you know that it's a, a freedom of speech issue but we could we could certainly um look at that again you know and or get other opinions on that um i i hear what you're saying al because i you have you know you can make meeting ending times and meeting starting times you you can kind of corral the meeting as and that's actually your job as, as the presiding uh, officer, so that has to be part of it, but it is interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting debate about, now I'm thinking about, you know, all the, Ezekiel's right, all the rules or any rule around public comment, you know, could be contested, so. Well, certainly defied. <laughs> and defied and yeah. Uh, so we've never run into it, and to Al's point actually, 
we have done, I've done that. Councilor O'Donnell did it when he was president. Councilor Shara has done the same thing. Um, have enforced it without challenge. It's just that I don't know if it could survive challenge. Um, but we and we've we've been. It's really rare. Um, we've endured some uh, some pretty harsh uh, inflammatory uh, remarks and out and out threats. Actually, from what I understand right now, for instance, there's a there's a meeting convening of the Arts Council right now where they're they're not quite sure how to deal with the public comments, which have been um, uh, ardent. And so, but the so right now, this is a system that doesn't have hard and fast rules. It does have our rules, but the rules are not necessarily enforceable. But at the same time, they do project. Uh, a sense of expectation, community expectation and standards. And you can be called out for racism. You can be called out for bigotry. And you're right, the presiding officer can actually call out those people or disconnect them. And I don't think you'd hear much of an objection. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, if someone were to challenge, it would probably wouldn't survive a challenge. But it would make an interesting court case, that's for sure. <laughs> but, nice. and, and, you know, sometimes you just have to live with that. You have to live there with that. I think it's incumbent upon the council to project or an expectation of uh, civility and, po and proper discourse and advocacy. Um, beyond that, and, 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 and in the hopes that the vast majority of people will comply and be, and be thoughtful and participate thoughtfully. Um, so. Karen. Yeah, um, Bill, to your your point, and and Jean Louise and I had talked after that um, comment that that you referenced um, the racist one and about you know possibilities to to stop that public comment and and as Alan Seawald had told us you know that that we have very little actual authority, but but at the same time people who come to public comment or who come to meetings, um, I I think want to be in a space where they're going to feel also that decorum as well. I, you know, it, it is not an uncommon thing that people talk to me and say they're afraid to speak about an issue, they're afraid to speak up. Um, and I think we as a council, through stating what we expect and, and, you know, it may or may not be legally enforceable, but I think we can state and model what we expect. We can help to create a, a place where, um, you know, that that's encouraging and welcoming of members of the public to come forward. And, and there will always be people who who are nervous or afraid to. But the more we hold the bounds of appropriate sort of, you know, sort of behavior of not name, not calling people out by name, you know, not make not letting racist comments slide, those sorts of things. I think the more we can do to actually open up participation. Ezekiel. I agree. And I also think that one thing, although it may create an open meeting law problem, um, but counselors there, we do have the rule counselors will not respond to any comments from the public. And I think generally speaking, that makes sense. But I do think as with all the rules, if a counselor wanted to respond, they could move to suspend that rule so that they could respond to a specific comment if it was particularly inflammatory or upsetting. Um, which I know has happened without a suspension of the rules at least once, but like that, that, you know, there's, I don't know. I think it's complicated and I think it's this, this is this weird, like rules that aren't enforceable, but are like aspirational. It's a weird kind of rule to have, but at the same time, like, I don't, I'd be hesitant to take the guardrails off completely. I think that wouldn't do anyone any good really. Uh, Karen and Bill. And this is actually a question that Bill may have an answer to, but um, Ezekiel, to, to what you were saying, um, you know, there is the rule that counselors can't respond to public comment, but I just want to make sure I'm clearly understanding the tools that are available to us as counselors, because can't we make a point of order objection that would, I don't know if I have the language correct on that, Bill, do you, do you know that exactly? Well, you could if you were embedded in a meeting, if you're in the meeting, right. but okay. you're, you're, you're not in a, technically even in attendance. You don't have to be in attendance at the time. So, I mean, I, I, you know, I, and I think, you know, 
actually, to Ezekiel's point, I think I agree. It's, it's just sort of like this, um, this very mushy, not very clear, not very enforceable situation. The alternative is not to have public comment at all. Some communities don't. Uh, several communities don't have a public comment section. This was actually Northampton's desire to have the public participate, and and usually it was referring to agenda items, and then it's long since evolved into anything and everything. But um, you know, there I I watched Nahoyo one year uh, with the old council president who would argue with people during public comment. And he presided over the whole thing and he wouldn't let anyone else speak, but he would literally argue with people who were speaking. Um, he, he was a Trump delegate, by the way. And anyway, the fact is, is that that seems really patently absurd. I mean, it's essentially a, 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 a bully pulpit for someone to, for the presiding officer and the rest of the public can come and be berated in front of this person or, or lauded depending on how he felt about what you were saying. And I think that's wrong too. And since you're not in the context of a meeting, theoretically, you're not held by the items of agenda, right? The council president, the, the counselors, if they wanted to participate in the conversation, which I opens a Pandora's box I don't even want to consider, but if that were to occur, they don't have to abide by the uh, agenda either in that respect. Even though there is public assembly that is recognized as the quorum of the body be present at the time and they're not speaking to items of the agenda. I think you really run into you run into a dark swamp there. Mm. Al. So, you know, I've I've been in that situation of sitting up there and, and having a member of the public decide to lamb based me personally about something. We've, Anyone who's been around for a while has probably had something like that. And, you know, our rule was it's it's a one-way street on public comment. We did have a section in our agenda called communications from council members, which may be analogous to your one-minute announcements, where typically we would do, you know, this group is meeting here and there's a fundraiser for this here, whatever it is. Uh, but we, we would, in those rare occasions, take that opportunity to answer, to use that a lot of time that I had as a counselor to answer back. And, and so, and it would happen irregularly because it, this situation wouldn't occur very often, but there was an opportunity fairly close to public comment because this was always very early in the agenda where if, if somebody felt particularly provoked by public comment, they could at least have an opportunity to, to respond. Um, and then you know we would simply move on with, with the agenda. There's certainly no requirement that people do that, but it seems like there's possibly an option where a counselor gets a bit of time and, and could say it if they liked. Um, Bill. Uh, Marianne will remember this, but we had a counselor who had a very similar to her name to her, um, who at one point decided that he stepped from his council chair and went to the podium and signed up for public comment. Yep. And he railed against someone who was railing against him in public comment. And then he railed at the council and then they eventually sued us mm -hmm. um, and lost, <laughs> represented by attorney Steve Wall. He was actually. Yep. Um, and, I remember but that. <laughs> there, he, he figured out a workaround that he would go and speak as a citizen. Yep. He's a citizen, and he said, I'm not speaking as a counselor now, and then I'm going to lambast you guys, I'm going to rip into you, and then I'm going to rip into the guy who just spoke before me, mm -hmm. and take my three minutes doing that. That is one, I, I don't, there's no rule against that, as far as I know, it, 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 but again, it was never repeated, no one else ever did it, they just thought, oh my god, now what have we wrought, <laughs> but um yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, there's, I don't, there's no rule against the council getting up and speaking as a citizen. Exactly. I was, yeah, yeah. I, I was, well, it, I don't know if this is similar, Bill, but I, I had, when that um, Trump mag, mag guy made uh, the racist comment, my first urge was to unmute myself and talk over him. And I just was thinking legally, 
You know, I, I did. I was kind of concerned about putting the council president in a, usurping the council president's kind of role there. But now that you're talking about it, you know, in a converse situation, that, if it's public comment, I probably could have done that, or maybe I would have had to sign up as a member of the public to. And you could certainly make the argument that I was impeding with their freedom of speech. But that was an urge I had to talk over uh, his comments. Just confessing. <laughs> It could happen. We'll probably be back up there again. <laughs> Al, you know one of the one of the things though about this is that and and everyone everyone wants to follow the rules, right? That's what that's what we're all talking about is having rules that people uh, ultimately ex agree with or accept and follow, right? But it it's not a situation of follow the rules or else because that's the thing about this is there's no sanction, mm -hmm. there's no sanction if you if you break these rules, they're your rules, right? You're the only ones who could create some sanction. And so that's something to keep in mind when weighing, you know, the, the cost and benefit of things is that it's not so serious that you're going to go to jail over anything like this for running a meeting or, 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 or violating momentarily a rule that you set up and have the ability to control entirely. There's, there just isn't a sanction. Mm -hmm. Oh. Uh, speaking of which, actually, um, I, this was a thing I actually wanted to bring up at some point, but the East Hampton year, um, several years ago I had a counselor who um, said racist remarks in private. He had said it not in a public meeting, and it said it, uh, but it had been chronicled. And the council recognized that they had to say something. They had to do something. There was no, there is no uh, you'll look in the charter or our rules, there's no way to provide censure or, or even to remove a counselor that you find particularly objectionable other than the public has to do a recall vote, which is a pretty high bar in order to happen. But the council struggled in East Hampton at the time. They were very newly formed and they're trying to figure out how do we express our contempt for the remark and our are uh, and and challenge the counselor who spoke, and they really didn't have a mechanism in which to do that, and they were particularly frustrated. Um, I don't know if you want to embed something like that. You could actually put something like that in the rules. The issue of censure um, when a counselor is not abiding by the terms of decorum. That's a good idea. Deal. I feel like that's, I mean, this goes to, you know, I would love a concise, a stuff puts in some concise definitions of resolutions, orders, ordinances, et cetera. But to me, that seems like it would be under the grounds of a resolution that the council could resolve that they um, found particular remarks objectionable or contemptible. Um, and I'm, it's one thing that is curious to me about resolutions and the way they're currently functioning is that the council tends to make resolutions about things beyond the scope of the local government, but rarely makes resolutions about, sometimes in support of a specific ordinance, but not say in condemnation of specific actions of the executive or actions of another member of the council, which I think you could do in a resolution if so desired, um, would be interesting if needed. I, uh, yeah, that's it. that is interesting. And I, I guess I'm thinking, it, I'm still stuck on the public comment because if it's something we allow that's not required, it seems like we, you know, what, what Alan Seawald said was, you know, public comment is now the public and it's, you know, freedom of speech. But yeah, but, but I guess I'm still stuck on, it seems like if we are allowed, what you were just saying, if we're allowing a rule that we can, uh, I mean, we could just shut down public comment and just, I'm not saying I want to, but I'm saying, I have some confusion over that now that I might have to follow up with again, Alan Seawald. Since it's an optional, you know, since public comment isn't required um, by the state. Yeah, yeah, Bill. Well, that's that's true. That's the Solicitor Seawald's point is that when when you create the space of a public forum and advertise it as such, then you are by you have to abide by um, the rules governing free speech. Uh, if you don't have it, then it's not a problem. But, you know, and to at what point, and that's always been discussed, you know, at what point um, 
would be the tipping point at which anyone would consider abolishing public comment. But it seems to hold, it does, it serves any, a multitude of purposes, not the least of which is engagement by the public and that you wouldn't otherwise have as a rule. I mean, you know, <laughs> pre-COVID, you probably recall several meetings where we didn't have any public comment at all. Or if we did, it was somebody, you know, uh, announcing some tag sale they were having or something. And, and, and there have been whole years where that's essentially been what public comment was. And then when there's particular controversial issues or issues that arise uh, in the larger scale of things, that prompt a lot of participation. And then with the advent of remote participation, even expanded the opportunities for people to, to comment. But that's the thing is I, I think it's actually an integral part of people's understanding of what the council is and what council meetings are. Um, by and large, it's all they, I mean, they'll stay for public comment split the moment we call the roll because oh, now they're just gonna talk douchey stuff and I don't wanna be part of that. And, you know, or usually leave right after they speak, after they do their mic drop, then they go off and, wait and you know, play Angry Birds or something. So. But I do think it's it's a critical feature of this, as particularly as the community perceives it. Um, so I wouldn't recommend abolishing it. Oh, however, you know, just so we are understood that the rules that we have governing it, just as Al pointed out, they're just suggestions. It's it's not like you know, it's it, we're just suggesting. We're asking if we're going to invite you into our house, please behave. Wipe your feet before you come in the door, and don't don't slap anyone in the house, you know. And then we can all get along. But after that, I mean, really, it's the, we have no agency as far as that goes. So I at least we have fifteen minutes and one more agenda item. I but I did want to just touch upon, even though it's not a rule, uh, the. The, the title, the use of titles, um, because it is a custom. Uh, and I'll just say, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking on it. And I've, I've been, I, I definitely have, um, of a, I'm of two minds about it, because what I'm noticing is, I personally like the buffer of having this like alter ego. <laughs> So if someone's yelling at Councillor Maori, you know, even when Laura said Rachel and I, you know, uh, to vote, uh, there's something it is personal, and, and I thought that but could be really good. And I and I think um, I struggle with it when I address emails. I was telling Laura, Laura, and Council President, you know, it that seems strange to me. It does, it does seem like I'm kind of, you know, uh, doing some hierarchy there. And so I can see that, and that part of the kind of problem with the how approachable city government is. And I also will just kind of own that. Uh, there's something about the, having that buffer of a title. It's not so much about the prestige of the title for me, but of just having a different name, you know, or maybe if I wore a white wig and a red robe or something. You know. uh, so there's something about that I'm gonna sit with. I just wanted to put that out there. Karen. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad we're talking about this, and I'm. Um, it's it's something I'd like to sit with and consider further. Um, what's what's coming back? So when I first started on council, and it, it was really hard to get used to, you know, Councillor Maori instead of Rachel or you know Councillor Dwight. Like that was really tough to get used to, and and I've actually grown to appreciate the sort of respect I guess that in in some ways that that it gives in those conversations and then with my constituents I'm always Karen I send my emails Karen you know when they um you know when I interact with people um so that's a shift I make with that personal engagement with people um and and people usually start off formal with me and then I I, I quickly just sign my first name and and it becomes that but, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about when I saw, the, you know, when you first brought up, we wanted to talk about this is I was maybe a fact not a lot of people know about me. I used to be a high school teacher and um, that was rough because I, I was 23 when I started teaching high school. Um, you know, I, had, I was not that much older than my students and it showed I, I until I had kids, I, I was getting ID'd. 
So, um, you know, one of the things, one of the most striking moments though, that, that ever happened to me as a teacher was a, a phone call with an angry parent. And she was, she, you know, it doesn't matter what she was angry about, but she was really angry with me. And what she did throughout the course of that phone call was she called me Karen over and over and over again as a way of sort of moving me down the rank. And I don't, I didn't expect teachers to call me Miss Foster or, you know, parents to call me Miss Foster, but there was something about the way she sort of weaponized that informality to sort of say like, you're really young and I'm going to lord that over you. It's, it's really how it landed on me. And, and for whatever that's not, I don't know that it's, it's, it's kind of a squiggly line to get over to council. But I think about perhaps a first term counselor or a counselor who may be coming from an underrepresented group, um, you know, um, somebody that's then joining this body. And I think about perhaps the symbolism of, of, of them being a part of that body and, and being referred to as counselor um, sort of, I, I don't know, I can just, I, I, it's challenging, I think, for people from underrepresented groups, perhaps to join in and, and referring to people by, by counselor and that formality can be a barrier. And at the same time, um, may also confer some respect, um, you know, from the public as people are um, talking with them. And I, I don't know that that was a super linear point, but it felt an important one to make. Yeah, Al. So this was something um, I used to feel very strongly about, um, which is that um, I didn't want the use of titles um, because I, in my role as an elected official there, um, I wanted us to be seen and understood for ourselves to understand ourselves as still part of the community, that we weren't separated by having a title. Um, <clears throat> but that, that was, that was me. And over the course of time, um, what I came to understand, and this gets to something Karen just said, was that I found that that people who had who are in underrepresented groups um, are not given the respect uh, that, uh, that they deserve as a human being um, based on their place in our society. And people in that situation who have achieved through education or whatever uh, a title um, want to be addressed by their title to ensure that they get the respect that, that they should have had just by being a human being. And that wasn't my own, that wasn't my experience, right? But that was their experience. And I, I've just come to recognize, and I guess this is, honestly, this is like pronouns in a way. It's like people have a right to be addressed the way that they want. Um, and it's no skin off my nose, whether it's Jane or whether it's doctor, that's this person who, who wants to talk to us or communicate with us. And um, so if someone wants to call me deputy mayor, okay, uh, I'm still Al, but in, in one phase, in this particular point in time, I'm deputy mayor. And just like this person who wants to talk to us uh, can be addressed as doctor, whether I would do it or not is not important. Interesting, Bill. And I'm with all of you on this. I think, I mean, you know, the title, of course, confers a certain solemnity to proceedings. It also goes back to the conversation we're having about decorum. Um, but it, it creates a special space. Maybe it confers too much authority and power for some. But what, one of the things that I found, for instance, when I first well, when I first got elected, everyone referred to me as Councillor D Dwight with a sardonic, uh, you know, hello, Councillor. <laughs> like, how is it possible that you are a city council? You, you, you look like you're on work release. And the fact is that it actually, when I was speaking with people in Hampshire Heights, they, I asked them all to call me Bill, and they never did. They always referred to me as Councillor Dwight and it was more important to see me as such for them. And they felt more comfortable with that 
that form of deference that made me feel uncomfortable. I felt what, you know, plays into all my fraud dilemmas and everything else. But the, um, and for some, and I think particularly when we talk with each other in a formal meeting, an emphasis on the term formal, it gives a formality that, you know, relying on Robert's rules of order, conducting all these rules that we're describing, all basically goes to one particular thing. It's to conduct business uh, in a in a tempered reason way with the prescribed rules and regulations that make supposedly make us more effective. And point of fact, that's true. I mean, we don't go in and have a free for all pissing contest between each other. We actually we subscribe to those. We wait till it's our turn to speak. We try not to speak over each other. We ask for permission to speak. We refer to each other as counselor so and so and counselor. I slip quite often, but we try to we try to. Um, perform that way, that projects on the community as well, the solemnity. You, you know, just a little before my time, there used to be a dress code. I would have been required to wear a tie. I got all sorts of grief because I refused to go and wear the tie. I mean, I, I couldn't even find a hair tie at the time, but it was, it, it, it was, that has long since changed. But the fact is, is there was this, and I was considered in, in rank violation of that sense of formality. I was the hippie bomb thrower. And so now I'm the old gray beard who, who basically thinks that, you know, I was like Alice, so let's get rid of the titles. They didn't really, they, they just created a, a, a certain power dynamic that I don't think I was entitled to. But at the same time, they actually do have value for the people who actually, and more particularly the way we conduct our business in the council. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, in this meeting, I think it's perfectly fine calling ourselves by our first name. So we would do it outside this meeting as well, um, since we're all agreed. But in the council chambers, I think um, there's just a place for it. It is bizarre, and I think Al's absolutely right. It is like the question of pronouns and how do we struggle to address each other? What confers respect? What confers contempt? And so on and so forth. And what is expected of the person to whom you're addressing? Um, you know. Do you respect me enough to refer to my title or do you hold me in in regard that uh, you don't like me, for instance, and you want to call me by my last name, like, hey, Dwight, you know, and that that uh, actually that informs the, the tenor of the conversations and debates and, and discussions that you hope to have. So I, in the main. It's not required in the rules. We don't require you call each other counselor. It's it is a it's a it's a formal. It's, a, it's similar to what we discussed before. It's essentially a, an informal agreement amongst us all that we will participate in this way. It is not. We don't require the public to refer to us in their by our title at all. I mean, it's absurd. We couldn't. That'd be crazy. We can't, we can't require it of each other. But the fact is, is that we defer to it because it actually it it sort of conforms with the proceedings that we're engaged in that we have to, you know, that we're going to do, we're going to respect the institution and respect our conduct in that institution. Thank you. Any more comments on that uh, subject? I will say, oh yeah, Ezekiel. Yeah, I'm just appreciating the nuance and thoughtfulness in this conversation. I think it's I am certainly has helped me understand more of the reasons why using titles can be can be really beneficial. And I also am just appreciating the space to sort of be thoughtful about it. I think that's helpful with all of these sort of unspoken formalities and agreements and customs that we take some time to think about why they are the way they are. Thank you for that. I, I just want to share. Yeah, I, I haven't really landed, but I, I have feelings about it. I, I wonder if, the, uh, well, first of all, I think that the new council and the council president, you know, I think it would behoove us to um, have a round of what do you want to be called? That's a starting point. So, okay. Well, I found this fascinating. Um, 
if there's no more comments or motions around that, we have one more ag agenda item. Uh, Laura. I have to confess that that's an item from a pre the previous agenda that should have been deleted. Oh, oh, okay. That's interesting. I, I, well, I thought maybe we had to review something about that. Is that why it was on? No, it was just a um, here. I'm not sure. I don't think there was a formal recommendation made on that. That was the only thing that unless, because uh, I know Councillor ah. Bill made a suggestion, but it wasn't really, there was no consensus that I'm aware of. So unless you guys want you know, um, to make a final decision on that suggestion, if anyone remembers what it was. <laughs> I can refresh. Right, right. That's why, that's why we, I think that's why we put it on there is because we weren't clear about whether there's a motion. I like Councillor Bill. That's very Southern. The kind of first name. <laughs> I was just going to say. <laughs> I kind of like it. You know. Well, it's well done, Laura. They cover but, all the bases. Oh, yes. <laughs> or bro brother Dwight or brother Bill. I like. Yeah. It. We should just get more creative <laughs> here. Yes, if, brother, if I may, brother so, Dwight. So to this point, there there is no rule requiring a full reading. We don't have one now. To make a rule that says it's not required seems okay. not useful. I think as the council president goes forward, again, with the, when you guys convene, that it just be made clear that it's not necessary to read an entire zoning document as a punishment to people. Okay, Ezekiel. Yeah, I agree. I don't think it needs to be a rule, it's not a rule right now, but I would hope that the next council president takes an invitation to read things that they feel will be useful to be heard out loud, but not to read things that are not useful to be heard out loud. I mean, we, I, I, I suppose in our report, we could have these more nuanced recommendations that aren't, uh, weren't, weren't votes. Some, some paragraph in our re report, I've never done those reports, but I think we could probably do that. Yes, Brother Al. Um, this gets back to a, a prior comment when I was wanting to make sure that all the documents associated with an agenda are available to the public. So if this is a if this is backup material uh, for the agenda that is normally being read into the record, I mean it, it really is appropriate to say all of the all of the information given to the city council is available to you for this agenda item here or here whether you have a couple copies printed or it's on the website, they can, they can go and see all of that. That's the point of making it accessible. So you don't have to do all this. Um, it's, it's there for people if they want it. Any other comments on this last agenda item? No, Comrade Foster, nothing? I don't want to end because I want to try new titles. How many ways can you refer to us? I can't wait, <laughs> Sister Rachel. This is why I try to, leave, you know, exactly. I try to end the meetings early. because You know, I can't keep my filter on after like an hour and 45 minutes. So you've, you've witnessed it. Um, all right. So it looks like we're finished our agenda. I would entertain one. Oh, I do want to say for my own sake, um, the next meeting is correct. Tuesday, October 26th at 6 p.m. I've been having trouble. Thank you. So I would entertain a motion. Move to adjourn. Second. Roll call, please, Laura. Rachel. Yes. <laughs> what I do? Yes. Um, Ezekiel. Yes. Bill. Counselor Bill to you. Uh, yes. And Karen. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Miss Laura. <laughs> Thank you all. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good, night, Good night. Good night. Thanks.